Hi, I'm Sam from Dogfish Head Brewery, and you are watching the first We Feast Beer Inquisition. Sounds serious. Dogfish Head is proud to be a member of the Brewers Association, which is the trade group that represents the vast majority of America's 3,000 and growing small breweries. And we felt it was very important to have a definition so there was some line in the sand uh, differentiating true small indie craft breweries, frankly from uh, the largest breweries beers that might taste good and be good, good quality and consistent, but they market them as if they came from a little local craft brewery. I'm thinking of brands like Blue Moon and Shock Top that come from the world's two largest brewing conglomerates. We felt that consumers deserve to know who makes their beer and we're hopeful and we see in sales trends that people do want to support small indie breweries that kind of keep the money that uh, the income from their breweries in their community and uh, support all the jobs that are right there in their community and people are going sort of back in time to the era when you'd go to the baker, the butcher, and the brewer as part of your daily life and, and get what you, uh, what you live on uh, locally. So I'm glad there's a definition. We've changed uh, the definition collectively as an association from 2 million to 6 million barrels, which sounds huge in the context of the average th of the 3,000 American breweries is probably less than 5,000 barrels in annual production. You contrast that to 2 million, that sounds like a huge number until you think of it in terms of market share. And the largest two indie American owned breweries, Yingling and Sam Adams, Boston Beer, each respectively dominate 1% market share. And the largest of the brewing, brewing conglomerates, Anheuser-Busch InBev that now owns Corona, that one company alone has over 55% market share with all those brands. And then the second Miller Coors, SAB Miller Coors, has somewhere around 30. So collectively, the 3,000 small indie breweries share 10% market share. And we really believe that a rising tide floats all ships. And if we help each other grow instead of infighting, uh, we'll all benefit from that. The concept of American beer was frankly like an international joke. You know, there was, uh, you know, I think Eric Idle or Monty Python did a skit acting like they were Australian men from the bush. We find your American beer is a little like making love in a canoe. Making love in a canoe? It's fucking close to water. And 40 years ago, that was sort of the stereotype of American beer. It was this really light, generic thing. And my hat's off to all the American craft brewers who had the guts to brew bold, flavorful, interesting, creative beers and bring this diversity and vibrancy back to the American beer world. Because we did have it pre-prohibition. Every city made really interesting beers that were colorful and reflective of the population in that city. Like Philadelphia down the road had lots of Germans, so awesome lager breweries. Here in New Amsterdam, what became New York, lots of Dutch, lots of English, so awesome ales. And we lost all that post-prohibition. A few giant breweries brewing generic or homogenous, I'll call it beer, went national and kind of dampened a lot of that vibrancy. Well, now we have it coming back, and now you see Italian breweries buying uh, Washington State hops and you know English breweries coming over and getting our yeast from America um, and it's wonderful to see the interplay and certainly most of the international craft brewers I know give props to the American craft brewing scene for bringing that diversity and craft and creativeness back into the international scene but I would punch any American brewer in the throat that didn't say what the Belgians have been doing for centuries is significant in terms of creativity for what we're doing here in America. So it would be absurd for American brewers today to say, oh, we invented putting creative ingredients in beer. I'm very thankful that sites like Great Beer and Beer Advocate exist. But I also think there's a little bit of a phenomena of, oh, that restaurant's too busy, nobody eats there anymore. Meaning people on that site, if a brewery gets to a certain scale and is recognized outside of that little community, they write them off as, oh, now that other people know about them, they're not as good anymore. So this continual search for this super rare white whale that exists in those communities 
it goes to an absurd place if you play it out, but I'm so glad it exists, even with that negative component. I wish it existed when Dogfish opened in 95 uh, to get the word out about what we were doing. Everybody's palate is different, and the reason there are so many beers is, you know, taste is subjective. So to have as many styles as possible, whether they fit within stylistic guidelines, is great. You know, our brewery makes over 30 styles of beer. We hope half a dozen of them piss people off and they hate them, because then we hope that they'll find an e equal amount in our portfolio that they love. We love to see breweries start coloring outside of the stylistic guidelines, and it's what we've been about since we've opened.